Good morning. Welcome to those who are joining us today online and in the Fellowship Hall. Today we are on the final chapter of the book of Hebrews on the last day of our Connecting the Dots of Faith series, connecting the Old Testament practices with what they help us see about the saving work of Jesus. So if you have a Bible with you or a Bible app, feel free to turn to Hebrews 13 as we walk through that final chapter today. Now I know most of us write emails or texts nowadays, but is there anyone out there who still writes cards or letters? All right, some of you. The reason I ask is, I think the content of Hebrews 13 actually reflects a little bit of what I personally call the back page of the card effect. You know, when you're going along writing what you want to say, and then you turn the page and realize, whoa, I only have this much space left. What do I still want to get in this note? And suddenly, the six-page story you could have told becomes the bullet points version to make room for all the other last-minute things you really wanted to mention before you run out of space. That's what happens to me, anyway. So that's my theory of why we now hit a series of seemingly random Hebrews 13 bullet points, which are, if you're walking through Hebrews 13, love, church, keep loving each other as brothers and sisters, hospitality, and make sure you show hospitality to strangers because people have ended up hosting angels without knowing it. What? I want to hear that story. Too bad, no space, moving on. <laughs> compassion. <laughs> Have compassion for and visit those who are suffering and in prison. Faithfulness, a reinforcement of the sixth commandment, don't commit adultery. Contentedness, be content with what you have. Keep your life free from the love of money because the Lord is with you and he is enough. He is your treasure. Trust. Remember your leaders and imitate their faith. And then I think he follows this up with what he does in case those leaders have been martyred by the time people read this letter. No matter what happens here on earth, remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You can always look to Jesus. And then true sacrifice. Don't start to think that ceremony is what makes you holy. People will always keep coming up with new practices or old practices that they say are holier, but the sacrifice we honor is bigger than our ceremony. And with that, the author of Hebrews hits a topic that he can't resist using the rest of his paper to flesh out for us, to make sure that we don't miss this one last bit of connecting the dots. In Hebrews 13, 11, the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gates to make the people holy through his own blood. Now, what is this saying? In the practice of the sacrifice of animals on the altar in the Old Testament, the blood of the sacrifices was what was important as the offering for sin. Because as Scripture says in Leviticus 17, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. The body, the flesh, however, after the lifeblood has been offered at the temple, was just disposed of, burned outside the camp. And in Jesus' day, the most holy place set aside for these sacrifices was the temple, in the center of the city. And it was not just a place where people would gather to pray or to worship, but it was seen as the place where your salvation would be found. You find it here or nowhere. And the problem with that, of course, was that very few of the surrounding peoples had access to that temple. And even if they could, many lacked the resources to purchase or give those kinds of sacrifices. Sacrificial systems served the purpose of honoring the holiness of God, of giving the honor, holy fear, and worship due his name. And yet, for an unclean people of unclean lips, the very fact of God's holiness could be a barrier to any attempts even to seek him. While the honorable and costly sacrifices were happening inside the camp, what was going on outside? Well, outside the camp was where you lived if you had leprosy. 
and were considered unclean, a hazard to your community. Outside the camp was where lawbreakers were taken to be stoned. Outside the camp was where the privies were set up. <laughs> All that to say, outside the camp is a bit of shorthand for among the unclean, the place of the outsider. But when Jesus, the Son of God, the spotless Lamb of God, the final sacrifice for all sin, who was in himself the living temple where God was dwelling in the flesh on earth, was sent to die on a cross. He was brought outside the camp, outside the city gates, and his lifeblood was shed outside the walls. It was on the outside where he died, the ultimate sacrifice of flesh and blood, given for all those who would confess themselves to be outside the righteous law of God, so that now all who look to him may by his blood become insiders through his grace. The high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering, but the bodies are burned outside the camp, and so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. The author of Hebrews continues, Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Jesus died to make the outsiders insiders by his grace. So, beloved, let's follow him outside. If you remember, this whole topic in Hebrews rose out of a reminder not to put your stock on rightly done ceremony. Because while our worship practices may help us remember and rejoice and honor our Lord well, which is good, they don't save us. He does. And when we draw a circle around where we think he can and cannot be found, we often find he stepped outside of it, looking to find and redeem those who are also outside it. When the death and resurrection of Jesus happened, the temple was completely redefined. Where your salvation is found is no longer a where, but a who. Jesus, the ultimate insider, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, chose to become the outsider to show that no one ever need be outside his love. Jesus comes to pursue the outsider until they realize that no matter how far they wander, his love stretches higher, wider, deeper. Until they come to realize they too may be redeemed by his sacrifice. This is Jesus who spent his time scandalously dining with prostitutes and crooked tax collectors, not because he didn't think these practices were harmful, but because he knew those who felt trapped as outsiders by where they'd ended up in life no longer felt redeemable. To society, they were no longer themselves, but only a label, a category, sinners. And they could never imagine that God would ever want someone carrying their particular label inside his grace. But Jesus doesn't call us by label. He calls us by name. And he doesn't see us by category. He sees each one of us in ourselves as precious and irreplaceable. Jesus told a parable about that in Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. See, the Pharisees didn't get why Jesus, who claimed to love God and honor the law of God, would hang out with people who were not 
honoring God's law, and we're not living in the way that he calls his people to live. I mean, shouldn't you avoid those people? Why are you eating with them, talking with them, sharing your friendship with them? But Jesus' parable presents a different perspective. Just because a sheep has wandered away from me doesn't mean it's not mine. It just needs to be found, rescued, comforted, and carried home. You see, Jesus doesn't love that people are lost or stuck, but he loves the person, even when they're lost or stuck. And this is so important for us to get as Jesus' people, especially since lost is a label that's not a one-size-fits-all. We can all wander into lost in our own ways, and when we do, we all need our good shepherd to draw us home. And when asking actual shepherds exactly how does a sheep get lost, what they say most often is that a sheep will nibble themselves lost. They just start following a tasty food trail from one thing to the next, and they end up following into a ravine that they then can't back out of, or they push through a hole in a fence, and then they can't find their way back from the other side. We get lost when we're hungry, when we're seeking things that we might think fill our longing And without realizing it, they take us farther and farther away from everything we truly need. And most of the time, we human beings don't even realize that we've wandered until we stop and lift our heads and look around and wonder, how did I get here? And if that's where you are, beloved, know that even there, your good shepherd can find you. Call to him from wherever you are because he knows your voice. And he wants you to know the love of his community of grace. See, sometimes people get lost by nibbling themselves lost, and sometimes we get lost by leaping. We just jump in without looking at, into what's of the moment, and then suddenly we're stuck in something that we hadn't imagined and can't seem to get ourselves out of. And when we find ourselves in those places, we know that we need the help of one stronger than us, and we need him to remind us that he believes we're worth it, that we're worth his sacrifice to set us free. And you'd think once we experience that grace, it would change our course forever, that we'd say to ourselves, never again. But the reality, I'm afraid, in our lives often looks a little more like this. such a very good thing that we have a good shepherd, (laughs) one who loves us as much as Jesus does, because so often this is our story, right? And he knows it. That's why he had to find us outside the camp, because that's where we need to know his grace can find us where he pursues us. Because the truth is, we live in a world that seems to be ever increasing in polarization between us and them camps. We all seem too eager to define what camp we're in and who are the outsiders to our camp. But Jesus calls us to follow him outside into a world where he doesn't call people by label but by name, where he sees in the tax collector and the sinner a sheep who he wants to give his tending and his loving care. And if Jesus comes to invite those outside to know they're not outside God's love, How can we do the same? What does it look like in our daily lives as we seek to follow Jesus outside? Well, as I was looking into this passage, I found this article, and I think it's an interesting example. It's called Fish Guts and the Kingdom of God. The article says, Nancy Matheson Burns, CEO of food distributor Dole & Bailey, describes reconsidering her career choices when she became a Christian. At the time, she was a fish buyer for her company. She spent her days up to her ankles in fish guts, as she describes it, contending with guides, blasting her with foul language, surrounded by calendars with inappropriate pictures. I've got to get a job doing something holier, she thought. This is no place for a Christian. So she applied for a job selling advertising for Christian radio stations. But she couldn't shake the feeling that God put her in the fish guts for a reason. 
And when she read passages such as this one in Hebrews, she noticed God usually kept Christians in difficult places rather than whisking them away from them. So she decided to try an experiment. She bought a bunch of calendars with decent pictures. She took them on her rounds, tore down their calendars, and put up the decent ones right in front of the guys' faces. Now you have something better to look at, she said. I hope it helps you have a better day. And the fish guys began to like her and respect her. Some days she was the only person who treated them with respect. And she found she liked them too. She appreciated their work. She enjoyed supplying her customers with fresh, safe, quality fish. And over time, she rose to become CEO and turned the company into a workplace where all people are treated with dignity and respect, and leaders are selected and trained for the ability to serve employees, customers, and suppliers. Many Christians work in places outside the camp of holiness, that is, in workplaces where hostility, ethical challenges, and suffering are regular occurrences. And sometimes we feel that to follow Christ well, we need to find holier workplaces. But this passage from Hebrews shows us that the opposite is true. To follow Christ fully is to follow him to the places where his saving help is desperately needed, but not necessarily welcomed. Doing the work of Jesus' kingdom entails suffering along with Jesus, and sometimes sacrificing possessions, privileges, and status may be the only way we can help others. Yet helping others is precisely why God sends us to work outside the camp in the first place. As Hebrews 13, 16 says, And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Here ends that article. As it was true in Jesus' day, when the Pharisees saw Jesus with the outsiders, they wanted to label him an outsider too. And you might find outsiders might resent the intrusion of one of these insiders hanging with them. So it can be a sacrifice truly to love like Jesus in a world that wants to turn people into labels and put walls around our camps. But if we're following Jesus, we have to follow him outside. Why? Because we love suffering? <laughs> no. Because the very best of any human camp pales completely in comparison to the city that is ours, the heavenly city to which we belong, our true home. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here, we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. We dare step out of the boundaries of our camps with the love of Jesus because we know these camps are transitory. They're not our home. Our home is not a where. It's a who. So we follow him home. And our true home is the place where our good shepherd carries the one who has been found and calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I've found my lost sheep where we with all of heaven rejoice to see Jesus draw to himself yet another heart hungry for his grace. And when that is our goal and our mission to follow Jesus in this, then our sacrifices look very different than those that God's people were called to offer in the past. And Hebrews reminds us what our sacrifices are to be for the one who has rescued us. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. So what camps are you in where you feel comfortable that Jesus might be calling you to follow him out of, to reach those who you don't usually see? What fish guts are he calling you to wade into in order to find and know and hear those who need to know they matter to the Lord of grace. What's holding you back? Ask the Holy Spirit to show you as you move through this week, remembering you are of a better city, an enduring one, a kingdom yet to be revealed. And then with that point made, the writer of Hebrews then goes back to his final bullet points. Give your leaders your trust since they're trying to help you. 
Do what you can to make their job a joy, not a burden, because making their jobs harder than they have to be will burn them out, and that won't help you at all. <laughs> and then the final bullet point, on that very same note, the writer of Hebrews says, please pray for us. Other than a few final words of greeting and blessing, he then ends this sermon letter with a beautiful benediction that seems to me a very fitting way to wrap our Hebrew series as well, reminding us both that we all need Jesus' redeeming gift to us and calling us to let our good shepherd do his good work in us. And I can think of no more fitting words to be our closing blessing in prayer. So let's pray from Hebrews 13, 20 to 21. Now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.